I, I remember that uh, very first fire was was just a small fire. It was, it was about four or five acres, but there were only four of us on it. And uh, and I, I remember thinking at that time, and and this was this is uh, really dating myself again. But back then we didn't have uh, fire resistant shirts, so we just fought fire in a Forest Service uniform, nameplate and badge, and the whole whole thing. Just put on a hard hat and and went to work. And I remember thinking. Um, that I was glad I was with people that knew what they were doing because this, I was right out of high school and <laughs> I was following somebody else. But I, I think that uh, I realized right then there was a lot that I had to learn that, and uh, I could get some quality, some real good experience right there. And uh, you know, it's sort of learning from those who know something you don't. And at that time, we were still putting out every fire. No question, the only, only fire in that time was a bad fire. It was uh, to be put out, and uh, but um, and we and luckily we could do that at that time. I mean, we had a very small district, and I think it, it was a full-time staff of three that doubled in size in the summer to a full-time staff, more than doubled to seven, so they hired four crew people, and that was us. And we were not unusual to have several fires. And, but we'd have volunteers. So um, at the ripe old age of 19, sometimes I'd get there and have 15 volunteer firefighters to try and figure out what to do with. And it was, it was a good experience, you know, I mean, and I, I fondly, I still don't mind the smell of smoke. It seems to me to resonate of being 18 free, making money, camped out someplace in the middle of nowhere. And that just doesn't have a negative connotation to me. I haven't really thought of it that way, but that's probably the best way to gain confidence is to be put into an uncomfortable situation and then finding your way through it. If it's all flat water, you really never know how to handle the rapids. So that's probably, I heard a consultant I thought was pretty good says, when you feel, start to feel uncomfortable, pay attention because you're about to learn something. So I think that in those situations where, you know, I felt a little bit over my head, but still had to, there was no choice at that point, you muddle forward. You learn a little bit out of that, and I like that. I like the fact that, okay, we've gone beyond that, you know. And a bit like being the, the ranger, I like to have some responsibility, not just be, this is your job, and, and uh, it's within this box, and the, it's clearly defined, and that's all you're going to do. I used to used to like to think there were a couple of kinds of risks that I was faced with in, in a ranger role, and one was uh, process risk. You know, how much of the process have we followed, and so how likely is a decision to be overturned? Um, I don't worry so much about that. I let somebody else worry about that, quite frankly, um, because I, I really worry, would would rather focus mine on what are the resource risks. That's the implication of the decisions I get to make on the resource now and in the future. So I like to think about not just the risk we're facing today, but the risk we might be able to manage for tomorrow. Whether that, you know, should we take the risk in, in uh, managing this fire so that we're set up better for tomorrow? Should we take the risk and maybe we don't have all of everything we'd like to have in order to, to uh, um, do this hazard reduction project in fuels, for instance, whether it's thinning with fire or whether it's uh, um, thinning with chainsaws and using the timber sale to do that. There's a certain level of risk in all those decisions, but I, I think that I'm, I'm aware that sometimes managing for the safest option just defers the risk to somebody else. And I'm not sure that's what we're paid to do. I'm pretty sure that's not what we're paid to do. I think that um, uh, Leopold's essay, Think Like a Mountain, he does a very, at the very end of that, there's a little um, discussion about how we all try to manage the cowman with poison or with bullets, the politician with votes. I can't remember the whole quote, but we all, after the same thing, you know, peace in our time or dullness, this certainly leads to a certain dullness, you know, and he said, um, 
And the quote I, I always liked, and I wish I could remember better, it says, but we need to be aware because too much safety only leads to danger in the long run. 1947, he wrote that, and thought if there was ever a, a good description of how we should look at risk, that's probably one of them. You know, if we're always opting for the safe choice, you know, we just defer that danger in the long run. Perfect analogy to what we've done with putting every fire out for so long. The public wanted us to. We believe we could. We believe we should, in many cases, put out every fire. And so we opted for safety each and every time, but we've, we're now experiencing the danger in the long run. Well, I've been pretty lucky. I haven't had any real disasters. Um, and I know others who have, and I know uh, people who've had fatalities on their watch, you know, and, or uh, something of that nature that really does shake them. And I, I've been fortunate that way. I haven't been. I've been close to them. I haven't been there. But I have seen um, the effect on others, you know, and certainly... Um, you know, and I don't think there's just one kind of experience, but um, one one thing that comes to mind is, you know, um, I guess working with, with uh, people, with tribes I'd never really worked with before, tribal interests before I was a ranger, and, and I came to really see how they looked at the national forest. And it's not, it's not as a national forest, it's their homeland. And... Uh, I had an experience with a tribal elder visiting a sacred site of their tribe, you know, of, that was sacred to him. And to us, it would be a, an archaeological site, I suppose. But to them, it was uh, a sacred site, a very sacred site. And it was sacred enough that I could see that it physically affected him, just being there, just, just being in the presence of this, of this site. Um, that changed the way I looked at the way um, we deal with uh, those that were here before we were and how important these things, uh, these places are to them. And we need to take that pretty seriously, that responsibility very seriously. And these days they're going to have to be multifaceted, of course, because they're not just going to be managing fire, they're going to be doing a lot of other things. They're going to be managing personnel, you know, and that's uh, certainly they have to have some interpersonal skills to, and communication skills to, to, uh, to be able to be successful. I look at them, ideally, somebody who is uh, open-minded and looking forward in the fire management world and not backward uh, to the good old days, if you will, the glory days when we were all young and uh, instead looking at the possibilities of the future. And I think it's probably particularly um, appropriate in, in the fire world because we have significant changes in fire policy that allow us to do things differently. And yet we have most of our folks in leadership positions have come up through the agency without that option of managing fire in quite the same way. So we still have some we're in the, in the transition mode right now, and it's going to be critical that we communicate up and down that a fire management officer has got to be able to communicate that there is a reason we're not operating in the same old way, uh, but yet some of the same old principles still have to follow. We still have to protect our people. We still have to, have to make sure they're safe. We've got to clearly communicate up and down the line. All those things are still there. And, uh, but in addition to that, we're going to have to talk to the public, not just like we're doing everything we can to put this fire out, but rather we're doing a smart job of managing this fire, and that may not be putting it out. It may be something different than that, and we're going to have to explain that. And, it, and we, we probably have not enough people who can explain that. And I think that our fire management officers are going to have to be better and better at talking about the full range of fire management.
One of the things that that uh, that marks that that works real well is to, as a as a leader, as a district ranger, workman, your park superintendent, whatever. People expect you to be confident. People expect you to know what you're doing, and they should. You know, we want, we have this experience. We shouldn't uh, probably say we're clueless, but at the same time, we uh, need to be humble in that. And and people respond very negatively to confidence without some humility that goes with it. And if there was, you know, I sometimes try to th Monday morning quarterback myself because that's the that's what I'd like to portray. I'm confident, but I have enough humility to know that I'm not, I don't know all the answers here. I don't, I'm going to make this decision, but I don't have all the, all the information I need. And so therefore I'm going to be humble enough to say that I may not be right, but somebody's got to make that decision. And, and that's invigorating to me. But I think the critical part about that is to, is especially in dealing with the public, is the last thing they want to hear is an arrogant uh, federal official. So we're paid to manage their lands, and we should never forget it.